evening, and it is definitely good to be back. I was telling a couple people that we watch the services on the internet, but it's nothing like being here and being involved, and uh, so I sure enjoy being back. Let's turn to page number 376. 376, let's stand this evening. We'll sing a shelter in the time of storm. 376. Let's think about the words on this first verse. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. On the second, a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock and a weary land. A weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock and a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm on that last. Oh, rock divide, oh, refuge dear. A shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. It's good to have Brother Brian back, and uh, Miss Jessica back, and Michael back. And good to see everyone here tonight. Um, looking forward to this evening. Uh, we're going to do a couple things just a little different, um, and looking forward to introducing some things, um, and uh, we'll, we'll jump in tonight. Let's have a word of prayer, and let's begin the service this evening. Brother Brian, would you have prayer for us uh, this evening? Amen. You may be seated. Um, I'd like to, starting here, um, we're working with, uh, trying to work with some of our missionaries to get a video. Um, I don't think we'll be able to do it live because some of our time zones are the same, but to record a video of me having them live on a, on a TV and uh, talking with them, maybe having them show us a little bit about um, their area of service and uh, maybe show down the road or something around their area just to get you connected with the missionary. Sometimes, I don't know if you're like me, you know, I try to send money to missions, but I don't always connect because I don't know all of them. To be honest, some of them we've supported since before I got here, and I've only emailed them. I don't know them personally, and I really want a connection um, in missions. So anyway, tonight we have Matthew and Lydia Meads. I don't have a video. Um, but we do have um, some pictures, but we'll leave that up there as I read this letter. Um, and they are in the uh, islands of Vanuatu, and uh, we'll show those pictures here in just a minute. Um, but it says this, um, Dear friends and family, Pedro's older brother, Avakin, has never uh, been one to attend church. The witch doctors threaten many of the men in Korea, Korea, area that they will be cursed with a sickness if they go to church. Now, you've probably read stories about witch doctors. They deal with them. 
on a, on a daily basis. Uh, now that Pedro has begun teaching the firm foundations lessons, things are changing. Rather than trying to get these men into church on a Sunday, he is teaching the Bible on different days of the week in individual villages. As they meet in neutral, everyday settings, everyone is welcome to come and listen and encouraged to ask questions on things they don't understand. Although Pedro's brother have always, brothers have always been anti-church, they were the first to come and have continued to be eager listeners. Avakin is an especially keen advocate, promoting the teaching everywhere he goes. Pedro is currently teaching in two different villages and soon to start in a third location. His wife, Julie, is a vital help in translating the lessons into the, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Akiai language. They're, they have a language barrier over there, but they're trying to transfer it over. Um, there's also been another man who's been helping them with the checking process as they work into their language. Please pray for us as we continue with the translation and supporting Pedro in the outreaches. Pray for Pedro as he teaches and for the ones listening that God will open their hearts. They have also started teaching Bible lessons in town and are enthusiastic about the prospect of reaching more of these people who don't go to any churches and have never had a clear understanding of the gospel. They do want us to be in prayer. They've had many break-ins, so they're putting a fence around their place. Um, and there's also a few different other things. Um, they are concerned about some land. Um, over there, it's different when they get land for property. They thought they owned the property, but um, without reading all this to you, um, because of the way they did it, they're now telling them, yes, you own the land, but you have to pay some more. But thankful, that's just the way it works over there. But thankfully, it's not as expensive as it could have been. So anyway, I want you to read their letter. But Tom, would you pull this up? I want you to see where this is at. You may not be able to read this, but the, the main town that we send, uh, you can send letters to is um, Luganville. It's the second largest city in Vanuatu. Its population is 16,312. And uh, the city is called Santo by people from the islands who use Luganville as their big city. Go to that next one, Tom. And just so you can see, it's the little islands in the circle. Can you all see that up there? Um, just uh, to the east of Australia. Go to the next one. And just so you can see way in the right corner, just so you have an idea where it is at, right off Australia. Um, so just, just to give you an idea where they're at, I want you to get connected with these missionaries so when you pray, you know how to pray. And then a couple needs they put up here. Uh, Pedro's Bible study. Pedro's a man who's been led to the Lord, and instead of having church, uh, trying to get the men to church, he's starting churches every day. He's going places, and what a testimony. Um, trying to get these folks uh, to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, um, going to their villages. And then they also ask for Pedro's Bible studies, but also a discipleship of new converts as they lead people to the Lord. So be in prayer for uh, this couple. And um, um, they really have not been affected too much with the virus, uh, but just a little bit here and there. So I'll have this out, but uh, let's do be in prayer for uh, the Meads family uh, to uh, Vanuatu. So let's uh, go to our next song, Brother Brian. I don't even know what that is. Page 8 9. Songs away in the manger. Page 89. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus 
No crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus. Look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and take us to heaven to live with be there. Pastor. All right. Let's get some ushers to come forward if we can. <clears throat> Looking forward to, uh, I think it's the 20th. I don't have that right in front of me. I believe the 20th. Uh, we are still planning on having our Christmas program. Um, uh, look forward to that. Would you pray? We have uh, some meetings coming up with uh, some folks who have come to the church or they've come and they haven't been here in a while. Um, we have a couple, um, Lord willing. Um, so just be in prayer for that. We had a visitor, brand new visitor this last Sunday, and uh, we're just going to see God's still working. And always remember that, and um, you be faithful and diligent uh, to be safe, but give the gospel. And uh, what a good time to do that. And uh, I'm looking forward to what God's going to bring out of this. Um, what is God going to do? And uh, I'm looking forward to it. All right, um, uh, Sean, would you ask God to bless the offering? And we will take this up this evening. All right, for our last song this evening, let's turn to page 375. 375, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way and sorrow like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. On that third verse, my sin, oh the bliss 
of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul on that last and Lord, haste a day when my face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. All right, take your prayer list. Colin, would you do me a favor? Would you go put hand sanitizer on and then come up here and hand these out for me? All right. What are we praying for tonight that we need to add to the list? I just about... Go ahead, Brian, now. Pray for uh, this Brian Brown's dad and probably that Brian Brown's dad um, struggling with, I mean, really kind of losing his mind a little bit. And uh, is, it, is it Alzheimer's? Dementia. Yes. Okay. So pray for, what's your dad's first name? Jess Stone. Okay. Okay. And then tell me again your dad's first name. Sam. Okay. All right. Somebody else tonight? Miss Connie? So uh, continue to pray for Stoney with his oxygen. Yes. Yes, pray for, continue to pray for Joe and uh, Tierra. I just got off the phone with um, Joe's son. He just got off the phone with the hospital. Um, Monday night we had a scare. I think it was Monday night. Um, he was on with the mask, um, almost 100% oxygen. Um, they were wondering if they were going to have to put a tube down him, and, um, and he didn't have that. He did not want that. Um, we were real concerned, but God brought him through. Tuesday, he was doing just fine. And then Tuesday evening, his son called and said he's back on the, you know, being almost fully on the, the oxygen, and they're trying to do dialysis now. And it's, it's, it's very hard for him. He's very weak. So they took him off the dialysis. They got as much as they could. Then they took him off last night and got him back to his room and um, just kept the oxygen on him. And so as of tonight, um, tomorrow they're going to, I think it's tomorrow, they're going to take him back to try to finish with the dialysis. 
Um, but as far as tonight, um, he's on 65% oxygen. Um, so just really weak. And uh, really just basically sleeps, really doesn't talk too much, doesn't, you know, just kind of out of it. So pray for Joe. Um, of course, we said Stoney already with his oxygen uh, to be able to continue to breathe better. Um, let's be in prayer for uh, them for sure here. Yes, ma'am? Amen. Okay, so let's pray for Tierra to get um, a place closer to work. Um, continue to pray for um, George Shadon. He has the virus. Um, he is in the hospital right now. If you would. All right. Anything, Tom? Yes, continue to pray for Miss Rose. Really pray for her health. She's struggling. Um, okay, anything else tonight? I feel like I'm missing something. It should be seven. Yes. Okay. For those of you at, on, on Facebook there, uh, pray for Candace. Um, they have a four-hour test. What, what day did you say? She told me. Friday at 8 o'clock. So be in prayer. They're still trying to figure out what's going on. Um, she's having a hard time. So just be in prayer for her. Um, has anyone on Facebook said anything that I need to add? If those of you on Facebook, if you say anything uh, throughout the message, Tom, just write those down and get those to me at the end. Um, is that everything? Yes, sir? Okay. Brother Bob's got an appointment tomorrow. Pray for him and his health. Um, we should probably be praying for um, anything else that we need to add. Okay. All right. You got a paper. Um, it's it's nothing nothing fancy. Um, just I, I just wanted to give you some thoughts. Uh, we're gonna go. Uh, we're going to do some of the messianic prophecies throughout the Old Testament. We will still probably go through that. But before we get to um, Isaiah chapter, we are going to be in Isaiah chapter seven. Before we get to verse fourteen, the verse that all of you know. Um, before we get there, I want to give us the background and give us kind of the idea on what's going on in this chapter. So this is going to be a two-part series tonight leading into Sunday morning, Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 7, and you're going to see the phrase down in verse 9 that is going to be our theme tonight and Sunday. And as we look into uh, Christmas time in December, um, I, my wife and I, we started something. Um, we, we've been reading the same portion of Scripture, but we started to read together. Um, like we, would each, we would tell each other what book we're reading, and we'd read the same book, but we kind of one got ahead of the other, so we weren't able to talk about it. So we started the book of Isaiah uh, this week, and um, we're trying to read it at the same pace so we can talk about it, and we can kind of uh, find things out. Um, but anyway, and I got to Isaiah 7. And I was already going to do a series on the messianic uh, prophecies of the prophecy of Jesus coming in the Old Testament. I was already going to do that, but this just kind of fell into place. So anyway, um, let's jump in tonight. Look at verse 1 of chapter 7. 
We are going to go to the book of 2 Kings uh, here in just a little bit, and we will go to the book of 2 Samuel here after a while. So just bear with me. I want to give you some thoughts tonight. Um, if ye will not believe. Let's look here. Chapter 7, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, Rezin the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, remember that saying, that's important, a saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, that is the northern kingdom Israel, Ephraim, uh, that's what they called it. And his heart was moved, and it's the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. In other words, they were scared. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. Oh, for the mercy of God. Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, remember that name, that's Isaiah's son, that name's important, thy son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet, Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands were the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, What does God say? It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. What would not stand? Syria and Israel would not come into Judah and overtake it at that time. Okay, does everybody see? God made a promise it would not happen. Now look at verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. Within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Now everybody look at verse 9 very closely. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. The capital is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If ye will not believe, this is Isaiah under the influence from God, the words of God. If ye will not believe to the king of Judah, Ahaz, surely ye shall not be established. There is so much in these first nine verses. I could not skip over them to go to that next tab. We've got to look at this very closely. We're going to try to get an idea on where we're at tonight. So I've given you a paper. We'll look at that here in just a minute. Let's open with a word of prayer. God, Lord, we need you. We love your word. God, speak to us. Lord, I don't want to just give facts. God, I'm not here uh, to try to give an opinion. God, I really want you to be glorified as we look into this, God, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Another theme I thought, are you firm in your faith? Conflict and chaos lead to a lack of faith. Now, I'm not going to talk about the virus tonight. I'm going to try not to bring it up too much. You can go back to the last one, Tom, and just leave it on there for a short while. But this story here is going to reveal some things for a country, for a group of people, for leadership. And I want us to look at that tonight. If you cannot trust God when things are falling apart, you probably are not trusting Him at all. It is your faith a deep personal trust. What does it mean when we say, I believe God and I trust Him? You know, we, we use the phrase, oh, it's in God's hands, I trust Him. What does that mean? And I want to look at this very closely tonight, knowing who I'm talking to, those watching on Facebook, those here tonight, who I believe most of us would say we have faith in God. We believe God's going to bring us through. What does that mean? What does that mean? There's more to it than just a saying. Because I don't know about you, I've heard many people who are living very wicked lives say, God's going to take care of it. You know, I'll pray about it. And it's a shame. It's a shame. We'll look into more of that here in just a little bit. God is not just a principle or a thought process. He is an acting sovereign God and He is personal. Okay, so I want to make this, make this very clear. So, number one there on your paper, this is a certain time period in history. I want you to see this is a real event that really happened, that really took place. In that blank, if you'd like to put there, 
and you can put any notes you want on this paper, but you can put somewhere around the time of 735 B.C., somewhere in the, the 16 years after that, somewhere in there, we believe it to be 735 B.C., this would take place. A certain time period in history, um, a specific period of time. Um, he, uh, Ahaz would reign from 741, I think, to 725 B.C., but there was a crisis. What was going on? There was a crisis here in Judah. The crisis was, if you know Judah, two tribes of Israel were on the southern end of Israel. You remember after Solomon, the kingdom split. Ten kingdoms remained in the north. Two kingdoms remained in the south. They would be known as Israel and Judah, if you will. Um, and Israel's capital was Samaria. Well, what had taken place at this time in history, a big group of people named Assyria was becoming, coming into their own and becoming the dominant world power, if you will. They, at this time when this is taking place, they are worried about their eastern front. So they were not worried about this yet. Egypt down below Israel was already a very powerful world power, if you will. So because of those two world powers, Syria and Israel, uh, before Assyria would take the northern kingdom, they were united and they wanted to take over Judah so they could have somewhat of a united front when Assyria may have come to fight with them. So what is taking place, there's this crisis, the, the uh, ten tribes of Israel to the north and Syria are coming down and they want to destroy Judah and Jerusalem. They want to take it over. They want to become the world power. As up to this point, from what we can understand, already 120,000 people have died. Okay? 120,000 people have died. Would you say that's a crisis? Man, that's a scary thing. Man, that's something to fear. That's something to be worried about. That's what he was doing right here. So they had come together with this alliance. They want to create a united front, but Judah is not playing the game. You know, they've come down. They were not able to defeat them. But we find in the, the passage of Scripture here in chapter 7 in um, verse 1, we find that during this time they've come down against it. They could not prevail against it. And in verse 2, we find frightened leaders and people. Frightened leaders and people. In that next phrase, uh, particular and called out people. Notice in verse 2, it said the house of David. They were God's chosen people. It's very important to understand this really took place. It was a certain time period of history. These were God's chosen people. The house of David, okay? Stay with me. We're going to look at that here in just a little bit. This was a fearful time, a time of decision, a time of reflection. And we won't look at there right now. Ahaz was a king, good king or bad king? Remember? Bad, bad, bad king. He actually made his sons, as was the custom of the pagan people, offered his sons in the fire to their gods. It says that in 2 Kings. He was a very wicked man. In our opinion, did he deserve the mercy of God? No, not really. He was, though, the king over Jerusalem. He was the king over the tribe that God had promised to David. God had made David promises. God would come to him of the house of David. And knows, notice what is said here in verse 2. It was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood, are moved with the wind. Ahaz, in our opinion, did not deserve the mercy of God. Very wicked man, very wicked king. He revered the gods of Damascus. He stopped sacrifices in the temple. He had made his children to walk through the fire. So notice the way he handles this situation. Fear. Fear. You notice here, um, his heart was moved in the heart of his people as the trees of the wood. In other words, they are shaking in fear. Shaking in fear. Ahaz and the people. These are the people of David. This is the royal family that should not be shaking. The house of David to whom God had made great promises. In their mind, Yahweh made a solemn covenant with David. Did they have any reason to fear? God was in control, correct? 
Did they have the promises, the covenant? Yes. You have no need to shake as the trees of the forest. Take your Bible if you would. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Ahaz, because the Jewish people were so meticulous in their record keeping, Ahab would have known, or Ahaz would have known this. 2 Samuel chapter 7. I think that's the wrong chapter. I put the wrong one down here. Yes, I did. I'll just have to tell you the story. David was commissioned by God, by Samuel would come, and he would anoint him king. David was going to be the next king of Israel. God promised him that he would take care of them. He would bless him. He would help him. David would have had a blessing from God. Ahaz would have known that because of the meticulous record. Ahab would have known that God had given this covenant. But in, uh, I don't remember what chapter, I didn't write it down. He promises his throne would continue, but he would punish disobedience. Now, something interesting takes place. We're going to look at this here in a short while. The king Ahaz would go to the Assyrian Empire and he would ask the king for help. God made a promise to his people that he would keep them in this throne, right? God made a promise of that. God told me he would take care of me, he would bless them. Ahaz went and looked at the most powerful people in the world, he thought at the time, and said, come down here and help me defeat Israel and help me defeat uh, Syria. Come down here. Notice that's where we're at in verse 3. So the Lord comes, the Lord uh, said to Isaiah... Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. God intervenes out of mercy. Does everybody see that? After what they had done, after the paganism, the heathenism, after they turned from God, God comes to Isaiah and says, go down there. Tell him that I am still in control. He doesn't need to do that. God intervenes. Why is it when God intervenes, you find this funny, why is it when God intervenes, people get mad at Him for intervening, but when God does not intervene, people get mad at Him for not intervening? I'm talking about people who don't believe in God. You know, they say, well, why doesn't God stop, you know, rape when it happens? Well, in certain places of Scripture, God destroyed a whole group of people who are very wicked people, and then they say, well, why did God destroy that group of people? <laughs> People just decide not to, not to, they don't want to believe in it. They don't want to believe in God. God intervenes out of mercy. God tells Isaiah to tell Ahaz his part in Yahweh's, uh, Yahweh's plan for the world and his people. This is an alert to remember God's promises. As Isaiah comes before the king, probably when he's at this uh, conduit, we'll talk more about that here in just a minute, where the water would come into the city. Uh, when he goes to meet the king and uh, his, his guards say, and uh, here comes Isaiah and his son. You know what Isaiah means? It's interesting that God sends Isaiah and his son. It's very interesting what this means. Uh, Isaiah did not fear what the king would say or do because God was on his side. While he is been, being introduced in the Hebrew, Isaiah's na name means Yahweh is rescuer or Yahweh is salvation. As he would come before the king and they said, this is Isaiah, in the Hebrew what they would say, Yahweh is rescuer or salvation. This is what's very interesting. I thought this was wonderful when I read this. Sheer Jashub, I'm going to keep having a hard time, his son God sent with him. You know what that means? A remnant will return. When they were being introduced, the king would have heard Isaiah, the Lord is salvation, the Lord, uh, will, uh, the Lord is salvation. Or uh, Shir Jashub, which would mean a remnant will return. In other words, God is willing, but you're not going to, so God's going to keep his promises that a remnant is going to come back. I found that very interesting. An absolute devastation was going to take place here in a short while. In spite of this devastation, 
a remnant will be left. Do you believe God and his word? You say, what was uh, Ahaz? Stay with me. It's all introduction. I promise the part of the message is not going to take long. What do you think Isaiah, was, or excuse me, Ahaz was doing out by the, the, the upper pool, the conduit? Most scholars believe that he was up there checking the water supply because he understood that there may be a, um, uh, what am I trying to say, um, where they come and surround them. Sorry? Yeah, they block it all and they could block the water. He was probably checking the water supply, probably making sure they would have enough. God goes out there. God meets with them through Isaiah. And this is what Isaiah says to him in verse 4. And say unto him, Take heed, be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted. God in his mercy, Ahaz didn't deserve that mercy. Ahaz was a very wicked man. God comes through Isaiah to intervene on behalf of his promises that he has made. He said, take heed, be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted. He had sent a message to Assyria, a new power. Take your Bible and go to 2 Kings chapter 16. I want you to see what this man has done, or what this man would do. Is everybody still awake? Everybody still good? Okay, 2 Kings chapter 16. I know this one is right. I wrote this one right. 2 Kings 16. Okay, a battle has already taken place in verse 5 and 6. Verse 7 of 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 7. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Assyria, of Syria, and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. Notice what Ahaz does. Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. Not only did he do this, but when he would send the messengers, eventually he would go up to see them in these later verses, and he would use some of their worship rituals that they would do for their pagan gods, and he would bring that back to Jerusalem. Instead of seeking God, he sought a man he thought had the power. Instead of seeking God, he thought he would go to someone that made sense. Do you see how wicked this man was? God came and God said, Isaiah, you go tell him. Hey, sit still. Be quiet. Relax. It's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of it. This pagan king who would go behind the back of God and go and search out this man. Let's not be too critical. Because we may not to that extent, but there's many times. We're going to get to this shortly. There's many times we go to what we can see what makes sense to us instead of trusting God and His promises. Now, so he does this, and that's a fascinating chapter in 2 Kings chapter 16, but we don't have time to read all of that. Back in Isaiah chapter 7, he said, Take heed, be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted. How dare you defy God's plan? The word take heed means to put a hedge around. Hey, pay attention, watch what you're doing. Be quiet means to calm down. Not necessarily from the war, but calm down from your unbelief, maybe your fear. And fear not just simply means don't be frightened. Why? Because of who God was. God was the one who made the covenant with David for Israel, that they would be on the throne. Calm down. Why, did, why could he be calm? Notice the wording Isaiah uses here from God. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, it's the idea of Syria and Israel, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Remaliah. The idea of the firebrands is, um, you know how like towards the end of a, a stick, there would, you'd have it on fire, it would burn itself down, it would almost be out. He was using that as an analogy that Syria and Israel are not going to last much longer. 
He's actually going to say that in the next few verses. He says, fear not because you don't understand what is going to take place with Syria and Israel. All you understand right now is what you can see, and that is the enemy is coming at you, and they're more powerful than you. So just trust me because of what I've said and who I am and the promises I've made. And you know what Ahaz said? No, I, I, can't, I can't put my faith into that because I can't see it. What I can do, Assyria, man, they're, they're getting bigger and they're stronger and they're more powerful. If I get them on my side, we're going to be okay. Practically speaking, have we ever done that? I mean, honestly, we've seen this major problem that we can see, but what we don't understand is that God sees the other side of it. We don't. We cannot comprehend What's over there? All we can see is what's in front of us. And all Ahaz saw was an army that was going to come down and take everything he thought so highly of. Now as we continue here, um, because Syria, Ephraim, in verse 5, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach there and for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiam. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand. You understand, I put three thoughts there on your paper. There's a frightening scenario. There's a fear from the leadership, and it doesn't say here in this passage of Scripture, but I'm sure the people were pretty terrified themselves. And then thirdly, the faithfulness of God is still present. My friend, that happens all the time. Frightening scenario. Fear from leaders and the people. And yet the faithfulness of God is still present. Those three things take place on a daily basis. Now, that is what was going on here. God saw the other end of it. And He said, it shall not stand. Neither shall it come to pass. Now, verse 8 is a little tough to, under, tough to understand here. Now, look closely with me. For the head of Syria is Damascus, okay? And the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Now, three score and five years is 65 years. 65 years. Now, Israel was going to be gone, I think I, think I read about 8 to 11 years. So what does this 65 years mean? I'm not 100%. It seems to refer back to Amos chapter 1 and verse 1 when the prophecy came from Amos from that time till now. But I'm not, I'm not 100% on why he said this and what it all meant. But God was saying, they're going to be gone. <laughs> you're not going to have to worry about them in a short while. The thing you're so consumed with, you're not going to have to worry about it in a short while. But you're so focused on what's in front of you, you can't see that God and His promises promised He would take care of you. Now, look at verse 9, and we'll finish up tonight. I'm going to make some application here. Do you understand the story, the context, where we're at? This fear, this God is speaking to Isaiah. He's intervening through mercy, through a man who did not deserve it, to a people who turned their back on Him. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. In other words, they're not going to be the head of Judah and Jerusalem. Isaiah makes a statement to Ahaz. If ye will not believe, if ye will not trust, if ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Now, the established and um, believe are the same two, word in, same two words in Hebrew with a slightly different meaning. But if you don't believe Ahaz, God was giving Ahaz a chance to show that he would turn to God and believe what God had to say and believe God's promises. But Ahaz decides later that, no, 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 I'm going to do it my way. If ye will not believe, surely ye not, shall not be established. Uh, Ahaz, will you be firm in the faith that is right before your eyes? Will you look for a rescuer in politics of the world, Assyria, or will you look for it in me? Will you look for in frantic decisions out of panic, or will you trust 
and rely on me. Listen, listen, listen. Isaiah said, Ahaz, Judah will not be added to Samaria or Ephraim. Those kings are already there. Judah will not be added to them. He said that in the preceding verses. That's not going to happen. I promise you that will not happen. Will you trust me? God will not allow this to happen. If you will not believe, God's will will still be done. I find this interesting. His faith does not affect the outcome of the war. Did God, whether Ahaz believed or not, was God going to allow them to come and take Judah at that time? No, because he obviously didn't, and God still didn't take them. It did not affect the outcome of the war, but listen closely. It did affect the outcome of his personal life. Sometimes we think that God is up in heaven. Listen closely to this. We think God is up in heaven, you know, chewing his nails like, oh man, I, I hope, man, I hope Brian's serving me today. Oh, man. Honestly, we think like that. Oh, I just hope, you know, God's in heaven, you know, wonder if I'm going to serve him. God's will is going to be done. Now, I understand, God will use people, don't get me wrong. God's, it's not going to affect the outcome of the war by you not serving him or you on Facebook not serving him or the, anyone who ever listened to this. That's not going to affect the outcome of the war. The battle's already been won. That, you, you serving Him doesn't affect that in any way, shape, or form. You serving Him does affect the outcome of your personal life, the blessings God puts upon you, your service, your faithfulness, your love, your willingness to serve Him. That will affect your life. God was saying, you know, just because Ahaz decides not to serve Him doesn't mean the plan's going to change. God was just going to bless Ahaz, and God would have used Ahaz if Ahaz would have turned to Him just like he will for anyone. God is not in heaven nervously chewing his fingernails, wondering if people are going to follow him. He has already won. All he asks is you'd have some faith in him. You'd have faith. God would establish him. Ahaz, you have chosen to put your trust in Assyria. Man's methods, man's medications, man's plans. Therefore, only a remnant will return. Ahaz had every opportunity. Every opportunity and he chose not to. Now, I want to put these things down real quick. We'll be done. Okay? If you're going to have a firm faith, you're going to need a few things. Number one, and these things were all present except for trust. They, they could have been there. Number one, knowledge. Knowledge. If you want to put by knowledge, God is real and has made promises. You have a knowledge that God is real, God has made promises. Their knowledge and their records. Did Ahaz know that God was real and God had made promises? Through the records, yes, absolutely. He would have known this. Did he know about David and Goliath? Yes, he would have known that. Did he know about Solomon? Yes, he would have known that. He had the opportunity to know that. He could have had that knowledge. It would have been in their meticulous record-keeping books. Secondly, so there was knowledge. Secondly, affirmation. Affirmation. What do I mean by that? I believe they will come to pass. Now, Ahaz didn't get this, but this is what we need if we're going to have a firm faith. I believe it will come to pass. You know, people never specify what their faith is, only that they have it. <laughs> you ever heard people, especially in Hollywood, say, you know, talk about their faith, and they never specify what it is. <laughs> Very rarely will you find, you know, they'll talk about, oh, I've got great faith. Great faith in what? You know, explain it. An affirmation. I believe it will come to pass. A standalone entity. What we say we believe in our hearts. If we wish to draw near to God, faith is required. It is a standalone entity. There was affirmation. Now, how many of you believe that the devil and the demons have knowledge of God? I believe that. I believe that they know it is going to take place. I believe the devil knows his time is short. They have those things. I believe that. This is something that they don't have. Several times we don't either. Trust. Okay? You have the knowledge. You have the affirmation. But now God has made it clear to Isaiah to tell Ahaz, If ye will not believe, ye shall not be established. My friend, we have the knowledge. Man, we, we have the affirmation. We believe it. We understand it. We've seen it. We can recognize it. 
So why do we not rely? Why do we not trust? A personal element is involved. God has made a promise. The bottom line is that our wants may not agree with God's wants for us. Except that God knows what is best. That is trust. We have the knowledge, you know, the affirmation. We've seen God work. If you've been listening on Facebook, if you've been to any services, we've given testimonies how God has helped people through. We've seen it time and time again. God wants to do something wonderful. God wants to reveal himself to you. We're lacking trust. Ahab had all the, you know, he had everything right before him. All he had to do was trust, and God would have established him. God would have blessed him. God would have done things for him. I truly believe that. But he chose his way. He chose to look at the political powers of the world. He chose to look at the medications of the world. What was going to be best? How would it work? Because it's all he could see. Friend, tonight, we need to learn to trust in someone that we cannot physically see. We talk about our faith all the time. We sing faith is the victory. Friend, I ask you a question. Is that personal element of trust involved in your day today? Real, genuine acceptance that God knows best. Oh, friend, I hope it is. This is an event that took place. Sunday we'll continue on this, you know, Ahaz is going to put on this little little thing. You know, he doesn't want to tempt God. And, you know, he's trying to put on this religious act. Claim scripture in these next few verses. Man is wicked as all get out. He had every opportunity, and yet he chose. He chose. Friend, you have the knowledge. We have the affirmation. But we need that trust, that reliance. Have you put that into practice today? Is God's way acceptable in your eyes? Or should it be done another way? Is this right? What's going on today? Is it right or wrong? I just got to trust God through it. Amen. I hope you'll learn to trust Him more as I, as I learn. What a great God. Knowledge, affirmation, and trust. This personal part of it. So let's remember this as we uh, go to prayer um, t- tonight. So take your prayer list if you would. Um, and let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. But continue to be in prayer for our country um, and be in prayer for one another. Pray for the church. Um, I know there's a lot of nervousness throughout the church right now. and I'll Pray that God will give us wisdom and guidance through this. So let's all get together. We'll pray uh, in the small groups here. And we'll uh, spread out right now. So thank you. <clears throat>